Hey everybody, it's Daniel Grigge from The Break It Down Show. Today's guest is Michael Shevak. Author and co-author of six books, Michael has taught spirituality and comparative religion in the School of Social Welfare, State University of New York, as well as business spirituality at the Lakaka Center for Global Entrepreneurship at Lehigh University. His column in Business Spirituality appeared in Success Magazine. An ordained rabbi who has worked with the world's religions for over two decades, Shivak is currently the social responsibility advisor for the Patton Alliance. You already know what to do. Write for the brave. Go to savethebrave.org and support these fellas. We fight together PTSD. Hey, if you want to support our show, go to the PayPal link, put a little money in it, and all the money goes straight back to the show. So check out our website. It's breakitdownshow.com. You can find our merch or you can simply subscribe. Also, you can find us on YouTube, probably the best place to listen and watch our videos there. All right, enough of me. Here comes Michael Shevak. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbin. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan This East. is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hi, I'm Mike Shevak, and you're watching The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Mike joins us. Yeah, a new friend, Harlan. Harlan does some great He always has a conversation with guests. Some of them are uh, And there's just a wide variety of people. By the way, a little bit of admin. We've passed 1,000 episodes. And so one of the things we're doing is that a lot of daily productions with more time as other parts of the show that have started to watch. So you're going to see less day-to-day lives or short episodes from the existing episodes that have come out. That'll be a change. We're also going to do some new original content that has been in the works for a while and get those things done. And just basically, I need to back off the daily to get some of the bigger projects and some of the new concepts that come out. So as we grow, uh, it's always when you do things like subscribe, like, share. And also, if you're interested in helping me today, up here in the, uh, in the show, you can uh, go to the PayPal link. And just throw a couple of bucks in each month. I mean, that that money goes directly into the show, whether it's ads. Or, that's a, uh, that's just enough for the admin to let you guys all know sort of where the show is at. We're past 1,000 episodes. Holy cow. I'm going to be going for some enormous guests and some really hard topics. And I think Mike is kind of a blend of both of those things because he's a, uh, he's a rabbi. He's got first rabbi on the show, by the way. Uh, he's got a unique... He's an author. He's got a unique perspective on the world. And as we all try to figure out how to deal with the modern world that we live in, we tend to lose perspective and we struggle for wisdom. We have access to all the information in the world, but but that wisdom, that guidance, that rabbi sense that we all need, I think that Mike's going to help us provide for that. Mike, I guess where I want to start with this whole thing is, is as as the U.S. sort of uh, slowly walks away from from spirituality. Or, or they redefine it. Like, we don't pray to a God, but they pray to the universe. We have all these things. We, we start to lose accountability to a part of ourselves that needs constant, uh, physically, mentally, spiritually. I don't think we're balanced there, but I'm not the guest. What are your thoughts? Well, I, I think America is in a spiritual crisis. I don't think that's because the problem is America. I think there is a cultural and philosophical divide that has been brewing for close to 200 years. And that is the relationship between biblical religion, natural law philosophy from the Enlightenment era, and something which really became uh, rapidly accelerating since the 1960s, which is a religious perspective that's more natural and more earth-based. And these three things are dividing America right now, and we haven't put the pieces of the puzzle together. And we're at each other's throats when we should be taking a look at the history of what happened in religion and philosophy and help put some of the puzzle pieces together. I always want people to scope back a little bit, realize how fortunate we are to live in the United States, a place where immigrants commonly come and outperform Native Americans. I mean, they commonly, and I mean people who are born here and have every opportunity for birth, they come here and they see the opportunity, but we fail to see that internally. And, and I think this is one of the puzzle pieces. We get caught up in narratives instead of in focusing on uh, another thing that I believe is that if you 
if you focus on improving yourself, ameliorating problems, constantly improving yourself in some way, some fashion, doesn't mean just read books. It means all of it. You just continue to get a little better. We all get a little better, but we're all also able to provide for ourselves primarily. And the more we can do that, it seems to me that the better we would all be off. Yeah, well, I think the for America added something to the equation of the of, of the world that had never been added before in the same way, and that was individual freedom and individual responsibility. Prior to that time, it was the government, it was the church that was going to decide these things for us, and it added something to the whole philosophical picture that completely is a game changer. We've forgotten the meaning of freedom. We've forgotten the importance of freedom, and we, have, we, we keep looking for people to control us and different ways of controlling ourselves, but that's not the issue. The issue is to build a country on the spiritual gift, which is freedom, and freedom from a, like a theological point of view, if you don't mind a little too you know, teachy-preachy, freedom is unrestricted and unbounded and unlimited except by itself, which is another definition of God. We don't express ourselves as little individual pockets of freedom correctly, and we don't use the freedom correctly. And because of that, we don't know our power. We're always looking to someone else to do it for us. You see what I mean? Freedom. What? I mean, it's, it's, when you think about freedom, uh, you know, again, it's not just your freedom to do what you want. It's your ability to withstand, to tolerate. You know, intolerance, Michael, intolerance is a human trait, and it's so easy to just do that. But yeah, I have to tolerate your freedom. I have to be able to tolerate your point of view, political yes. stance, and we have to, at some point, work together. Right. And, right. and that's because freedom doesn't take place in a vacuum, Pete. You know, I have the freedom to walk off a cliff, but I'm going to die. So, you know, there are rules to reality here, okay? And if and if you uh, you kill someone, there can be vengeance against you and your family, which is how these biblical laws came about. You know, freedom has to be exercised in a way that is knowledgeable about how freedom actually works as a spiritual ability. It does. It's not in a vacuum. It's not everyone's opinion. Free, you know, this is not an opinionocracy. Okay. This is not an opinionocracy. Freedom requires a knowledge base on how to use it as the spiritual gift it is. And if we were to rebuild America on knowledge on how to apply freedom and use freedom in education and in government and in religion, okay, and in, of course, in economics. There won't be a problem re-energizing the United States of America. You know, I, I have one book uh, that I had written called The Six Fix, and it, it, it's all about spiritual health care. You know, we have to become spiritually healthy, and we begin with what I call value priority number one, okay? Value priority number one, uh, and that's uh, individual freedom. When we talk about freedom, again, we have to go back to tolerance. How does one, again, we have access to all the information in the world. I can find you world experts on topics who vehemently disagree on what reality is. I mean, this happens all the time. It's confusing. All the time. And it's easy. How many times in social media someone says, I'm just eliminating everyone from my life who doesn't agree with me? <laughs> that's, I mean, that's great. Let's just be honest about it. We can't go. We can't have a bigoted system that we put more bigotry into and get a unified, collaborative system that's good for everybody. Right, and you also can't do what is the mistake in democracy, which is you average idiotic opinions, and that's how the direction that the country goes. You know, there the the the, the correct use of freedom has to take place in a system that is devoted to truth and goodness. And unity, okay? Truth and goodness and unity. It has to take into a consideration many, many factors, okay? We, we can sit around and debate about God and reality all we want, but the fact of the matter is, if we get back to basics, there are certain things that are more important than others. The most important thing 
that anyone has is something you can't survive more than three minutes without, which is air. And we take that for granted. So what happens is we don't build our society on life-centered values. The most important thing are life-centered values. We need air, we need water, we need food, we need shelter, we need clothing. That doesn't mean, by the way, that I'm a socialist, so do not confuse that. I believe in life-centered values, building from how human beings, good, physical, hardworking human beings, what we need to live. And the, and by the way, Pete, the lesson of COVID is exactly that. Our economic system is not based on interest rates. It's not based on taxation. It's not based on money. It's not based on investment opportunities. This is nonsense. It's based on healthy working people. Without healthy working people, the whole economy shuts down. Okay? And that's because the word economy comes from the Greek, which means household. And we have to start treating each other like household members. And in household members, you can have different opinions, but you still have to have a functioning household together. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Functioning household. Yeah. Okay, so you say a word, and as I pick these words out, I mean, I think they're important to slow down to show how complex, how straightforward these uh, thoughts can be. Um, well, it's very simple to create spiritual health care, okay? okay. And, and actually, um, what you have up there is an older version of the book. So okay. it's, a, it's the same title. It's called The Sp Six Fix, okay? Uh, spiritual health care for a stronger America. It's very simple to do. You have to have value priorities and you have to have relationship priorities. The most important relationship in America for spiritual health is you've got to have a good relationship with yourself and you have to take responsibility for your life. Okay. You got to be, it's not just about yourself. It's got to be good deals for other people, all people. We got to think about future generations when we make a decision. We also have to consider all life and creation. Everyone's got to eat. We can't eradicate our food supplies, okay, and eat the wrong foods that cause pandemics. And we also have to continuously improve. We have to do all of the above, care about ourselves, another, all others, future generations, all life and creation, and continuously improve, okay? That's how that's the relationship priority. If you don't have those in place, it doesn't work. But you also need values, and values start from the body up. It's life centered. We need health first. Health is not health care. Okay. So let's not get bogged down. Health care is when you don't have health. We have to put health first. We've got to have some peace. We have to have freedom. We have to have wisdom. Wisdom is when we make our decisions so that they have care, they have truth, and they have balance to them. That's wisdom. Okay? And then we have to be able to express our full potential. If every single person in our country is not expressing his or her or her or his full potential, then this country can't be what it is supposed to be. And also, we need prosperity. And it's prosperity begins with health, because if we don't have healthy workers, you don't have an economy. COVID has proved that. But we also need to create a financial engine, because money is one of the greatest tools for spiritual advancement that, that human beings ever created. Okay, It is an incredible tool for sharing. And for speeding the progress in the United States and all around the world. So money and economics is important, but we have to have life-centered, balanced government and economy. Life-centered priorities, okay? Not invented-centered priorities. You said a little while ago, you talked about unity. And it seems like, okay, well, first off, from my point of view, Unity and diversity are really tough for those things. We seem to want to continue to diversify, but diversify at the expense of unity. 
people talk about um, becoming a socialist country. We we require a significant amount of unity in a country because we got to agree on what we're doing and where we're going. So we have this problem of we have wonderful diversity, but it's costing our diversity or, or costing our unity. I, I just took a survey a little while ago and I had to determine what my sexuality was on this thing. I had to determine what my race was based upon somebody else's list of these things. Uh, we can't agree on what racism is anymore. It, it, and, you know, not just, just to be clear, since we're you know live and on YouTube, I believe in everybody. I believe in you, whoever you are. I believe you can do it. You have the tools capable, <laughs> or you have access to, to dramatically improve your life. Just outwork problems. So um, let's talk about unity and diversity, and how do you reap the benefits of diversity, but also reap the benefits of unity, so we can care for one another, other better. Because if, if you don't like someone because they're different from you, it's very hard to create a this this world that we're trying to get to world where we care for each other we all have enough to eat we all have enough money to, to do things we do pretty good at this but we're also trying to simultaneously destroy our success right you're dealing you have to first of all america has a concept called rights rights and rights mean that each individual has a direct creation direct direct relationship with the creator okay each individual. It's not government that gives you rights. It's not religion that gives you rights. Rights are given to you by something that the Declaration of Independence calls the creator, whether you believe in God or not. Okay. Leave it alone. Call it a mystery. Now, unity and diversity merge. The minute you permit the other person to have his or her rights, in a way that permits you to also have your own, okay? It's like, you know, love thy neighbor as thyself. Do not do harm to someone in a way that you would not want that harm done, okay? The way you wouldn't want that harm done to you, don't do it to someone else. So whether or not you are a binary person, where you have male and female, or you're an intergender person, what you need to do is each of you need to respect the differences. I said respect. I didn't say agree. Okay? I didn't say have different opinions. I said respect. Why? Because there's a bottom line issue here, Pete. We are all citizens of the United States of America. We are equal in rights, and we're all children of God. Okay? And there's a fundamental unity between God and country, which transcends all of these opinionocracies. Okay, and I'm and yes, culture is going to change. We've seen what happened since the gay movement was introduced. There's been cultural changes, and it takes a long time to make cultural changes. We haven't even finished the cultural changes that are due because we had uh, freedom from slavery. But we're not going to do it unless we honor rights. And we honor the, the sanctity of every single person to be different, including opinions we don't like. You know, I always say, Pete, I would have lunch with a cannibal as long as they brought their own food and it was sourced correctly. You know, in other words, if they found a dead carcass on the road and wanted a sandwich, I'm happy to have a discussion with you on your rights as a cannibal. Why? Because any other way you're eating, any other way would be a violation of someone else's rights. So I'm all for stretching the boundaries. Okay. You know, I'm not a white supremacist. Okay. And I'm, I'm certainly not a, a interested in anti Semitism, but I'd love to have a conversation with them because they're American and they're souls, they're creations of God. This is the way we have to stretch. Okay, we have to stretch to remember the sacredness of our rights and the sacredness of each individual soul, regardless of opinionocracies. You know, and that's how we heal. And that's how we bring diversity and unity together. And I just want to say one thing God doesn't have a problem with bringing unity and diversity together. That's how creation is designed. 
Okay. It's a unified whole. Okay. We know that even more from quantum physics. There's, en- there's entanglements that where, where you change one thing, it changes another galaxies away. And there is a diversity. There is no two things that can be observed in all of creation that are exactly the same. Think about it. Find me two things that are exactly the same. You can't. Okay? Diversity and unity are is the fabric of this incredible reality that we're in. We just have to learn and open up to it and stop being afraid. So a, a guy who's on the show, he's passed, but uh, is brilliant. He studied in tank. He did a test called the Cosmic Bell Test. His name was Andy Friedman. And he, he talked about entanglement and religion, how these things go together, and freedom of choice. And at some point, you have to give up certain things because entanglement is more all the time to be a fact. Those more continues to be more and more correct over what Einstein when he had this conversation. And if we are, in fact, entangled, and he's the guy that studied the uh, whole, like, light your galaxies apart at entanglement, they can see. So when we look at these things, and, and if we cast judgment on somebody, I mean, it's easy to be called a racist. You know? Anti-Semitism has become, um, or I guess, yeah, anti-Semitism has become a lot more tolerable. Yeah. Like we are getting away from that. Judging people on the coloration in their skin. Whatever that coloration is, we're supposed to be getting away from these things. Is this in part because we're not doing as good a job on spiritual accountability, even if we're in a church or a synagogue or um, we're, we're a religious, you know, we don't do it or we don't, you know, abide a church. It seems like there's something missing there, whether it's God fearing or spiritual accountability, but it's easy to say these things, but if no one's holding themselves accountable, if no one has a guide, a spiritual guide, it seems like it's really tough to, it's easy again to go default to intolerance. Yeah. Well, the, you know, we are missing something. Okay. And, and it's, we have to break this down because it's not very obvious. If you have a democracy where truth is determined by each individual person, then implicit in that kind of democracy is a kind of fascism where each individual is their own little fascist dictator. Okay. So democracy has a flaw unless democracy takes place in the fabric of goodness and unity and truth with respect for rights and, and everyone's equal place under the creator. Otherwise, Democracy is flawed and is fascist. Okay. The other thing we're missing, and this is something which is a very, very critical issue. It's not just a white supremacist issue. It it is, it, it happens all over the world where there is cultural development of any country in a certain lineage. This country, America, has a cultural heritage which is Anglo. It is It is European. It is really British. Okay. And we have other elements in it. Okay. But our government and our, the the political philosophy that we developed from comes from an Anglo heritage. So when you bring in democracy and everyone has an opinion and you bring in all different people of all different religions and all different colors, and you give everyone a vote, there is a threat. And the threat is that you will vote the heritage of the country out of existence. This is, by the way, the same reason why Israel does not want to have um, Palestinians that reside within the state of Israel to be able to vote, because in a democracy, a Jewish state would not exist. This same problem is existing in Holland. This same problem is existing in Belgium. It's happening in Britain, which is part of the reason, if not the whole reason, that they, they exited because they were afraid. One of the amazing cultural solutions to this is what you see in, the, in, in, in Hamilton, that incredible Broadway show that became, look on the Disney Channel, where you have the entire history of Alexander Hamilton portrayed by people of color and different diversities. because. 
the American experience, which is so diverse, has to honor the traditions and the spiritual lineage that went to make us up, which is European enlightenment and particularly an improvement on British democracy that had gotten a little bit out of control. So we have to do both. It's not just a matter of everyone has an opinion and I'm an American and we have equal votes. And then we average, we average the results of any election and determine that that's truth. That's what Plato called hoi polo, poloi. That's like rule by the rabble. We have to have core values in which we express our individuality. You know, Pete, I got to tell you, the, the purpose of our institution of the, of, of the uh, legislature is not to pit one side against another in a war for power. It's that both debate two different sides of truth in order that both of them humbly recognize neither one of us have the truth. We can debate it to get a clearer, more unified view that's stronger because we're bringing our diverse, even conflicting opinions in. But the purpose is to battle each other for the sake of higher truth, higher truth. That's truth that's higher than any party. We've lost the meaning of democracy. Do you see what I mean? And we've turned it, and, and I must tell you, Pete, I am not red, I'm not blue. It all drives me crazy. If any one party wins, we've lost America. You need diversity. We get fascism. If any one party ever wins 100%, we've lost it all. They're not in the Constitution, by the way. Political parties are not in the Constitution. There are a lot of originalists out there. Well, let's get, you want to be originalist? Let's get rid of political parties. And, and just, just because it's fun with words, race, publica, and democratia, you know, the word race is the root for power, and then demos for the public, you know, the we, the pub part. Yeah, the power is with the people. We have this incredible ability to change our nation in the way that we all see fit. You do not have a mandate if you have, you know, 50% of the vote. 51%, 52%. You don't have a mandate. You have a mandate for unity. Find unity, find causes, find things that matter and work together. This careening left and right, this executive order form of leadership where people have bekinged themselves, you know, to, to, to bypass our, our system. It's just a further eroding of, of a way out. So I guess I have to ask you, are we past the point of no return? Is, is, there, is there no good person who can try to unite us and, and lead us out of this mess that we're in. I mean, we have so many things going for us. Pete, you're here. You're here. Okay? Yeah. Right? Humbly, I'm here. We got two good people. There are other people that can join us. No, we're not past the, uh, uh, the, the point of return. Because I will tell you something. This is a world which I believe God created. Some you can have your own opinion, but we'd still never we'd always have to agree there's an order here. There's an order to it. Okay. Whether it was created or not, there's an order here. And I've got to tell you something, you know, because there's an order here, and what you sow is what you reap, we're gonna get through this. Because what you sow is what you reap, and we're gonna get our lessons. But the question is. How much suffering and misery are we going to go through until we get to the other side? We can shorten that. We don't have to sin our way to more misery and more divisiveness. And that doesn't mean we become nebulous. It doesn't mean we, we, we pander. It, we can have good, strong views. But we have to learn how to express ourselves in a way that honors the soul of the other person and their right as a citizen, and also humility. Find me, Pete, anyone who knows the truth 100%. Does, is, does, is, do you know any mere human being that knows the truth 100%? 
If you don't know someone who knows the truth 100%, can you at least be humble and listen to your opponent? Listen to them because you might learn something. Blues might learn from reds and reds might learn from blue because you need humility. Humility. Do you see what I'm talking about? That's We need to just say, I don't know everything and I don't know any human being or any party or any church or any government that knows everything. Okay? That's humility under God. One nation under humility. Then we can open our ears and listen to each other. There's also a hundred ways to skin the cat properly and improperly. And they're all the same ways. You don't control the outcomes, you know. And so you might pick the best path at that instant. Two seconds later, wrong path. You know, that's just life. I, I've worked in Iraq, Afghanistan. And the one thing I've learned personally is that I don't know everything. I've seen my mistakes. I've seen my organization make the same mistakes. Over and over again. So I've learned to go, hey, I don't know the answer here. I just know that this is the reality right here on the ground right and if we want to improve this, we have to work within this reality, not some made up reality, not some theoretical. Right now, today, here is where we are. What do we want to put our effort into? And then let's stop and assess. This is delicate work. And, and we seem to think it's better to cast evil upon you. You're a racist. You're a homophobe. You're a transphobe. All these phobias. You don't even know me. You haven't even asked me my political opinion. You haven't had a conversation. You haven't had time to even understand that people move at different speeds. We're all wrong about way more things than we realize. Until we start to realize that, it's hard to become humble. So how do we develop that humble muscle? How do we work to, you know, put that tolerance and that humbleness and that, and that freedom back into our own lives? Because if, if you're denying somebody else freedom, why they do the same thing? That's right. Well, I'll tell you how you use that humble muscle, which is really great. I'm going to quote you on that because that's a great expression, is exactly what you were hinting at, is we have a reality here. We have a reality here, and it has rules and regulations built into the design of this reality. If I put my hand in fire, it's going to burn. So there's a, a you might as well create a new biblical law. Thou shalt not put thy hand in fire because you're going to burn. OK, there there is a way reality works. There's an order here, design parameters on how this world works. And we have to we have to operate our opinions in harmony with the way life works. It's not theory. It's engineering. All right. We, we you're not going to have a successful workforce if they're hungry. You're not going to have future leaders if you use the capitalist system incorrectly and enslave children and do things that are despicable, which is only what created the communist movement in the first place. Excess. Okay? And I'm not a communist. Okay? So we have to build our economy and our life on the way reality functions. Or what I say in the book is how life works for good. How do you operate in this world, in this reality, to create good? And God is just a contraction of the word good. And there are ways to create good. You've got to have life-centered priorities and build from the body up, okay? And you have to use the, the tool of money correctly, okay? And right now, I don't see people who are really talking to each other, and I don't see much wisdom at all. We need a wisdomocracy, not an opinionocracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the wisdom notes that I've learned is I've, I've grown older and made a lot of mistakes. Life will continue to offer you the same lessons and the worse and worse varieties until you learn it. I think that must work for large bodies of people oh, and for humanity in general. It will continue to say, here is the lesson. Here is the lesson. All right, here it is again. And it'll get <laughs> higher and higher consequences, you know, more and more uh, brinksmanship. Will we bother to learn this lesson? What? That, that is how this world is designed, whether by God or by some other agency. I'm being respectful for those who don't have a belief in God. If you act 
Life gives you lessons because you break boundaries. There, are, there is an order here. If you don't learn to align yourself with the order on how life actually works for good, you get a kick in the butt. Religions call that sin and punishment. Okay, but you get a kick in the butt because you sow and reap a mistake. And that mistake brings you consequences because reality functions a certain way. Okay, and if you don't get the lesson, we repeat it over and over and over and over again. We have had two massive economic crashes because we're not getting the lesson behind economic crashes. And we're going to have a third and a fourth and a fifth, and each one's going to get worse because we're not getting the lesson. That is the lesson is the economy is not our source of our supply. It is God and creation and life. And our economy is a tool. And it has to take care of life first and human beings first. And part of that is building massive quantities of money for sharing and for spreading good things because it is the fastest tool of spiritual transformation. There is money. No problem with it as far as I'm concerned. So, you know, we, we, we have to put it on the correct foundation for spiritual health. You were talking about a belief. I thought about this for a long time. I respect people's opinions, whether they believe, believe in a different God, however it is, handle that. And one of the things I've realized when I try to sort out God, I have to believe God. I know God exists. Silent Night is inspired by that. Sort of a Duomo in the building inspired by that. You know, all these things that are of God or from God. I mean, our, our laws, our you know, natural laws, law provided by God. So we know that there at some point was a God that people worked to aspire to, to please, to honor, to create, you know, for them the best thing that they could create. Michelangelo didn't paint you know, all those things because he didn't believe it. He painted him in part because they got paid and he was inspired. Not much this, but it doesn't exist anymore for a lot of people at all. But that's how I see that. Yeah, I, I look, I'm let me be very, very clear. We are in a country that has a separation of church and state. All right. I don't think that's a mistake. It just simply says that the government does not have a church that is the official church of the government. Germany has one. It's Lutheranism and Catholicism, or the Stadtkirchen, the two church. We don't have that in the U.S. So we're not endorsing one particular religion. I don't know personally whether God exists. I've never met God. Okay? I just don't know. Uh, do I believe it? Yes, because that's my experience. My experience is that life is ordered, and when we align ourselves to God's laws, we have a better life. And so I basically believe the biblical narrative. That's how I live. I'm not going to force that on other people, but I'm going to tell you the actual laws of God are based on reality. In other words, when you build an economy, let's say you build an investment on a defaulted loan, which is what happened a few years ago. We built and an, an investment opportunity, a, a brilliant idea. Someone had a bubble in their mind, and you wonder why the bubble bursts. Let's build an investment on defaulted loans. Well, I'm going to tell you how life works right here for your audience. When you don't have life value, when an investment like that is invented in your brain and it doesn't have any life value, it will only last as long as it, the life value in it is there, that investment paid for a few school lunches and a few houses for some Wall Street people, and then the entire economy tanked because it was based on a false investment okay, that had no life value. And this is to your point earlier. If we don't operate on a reality-based, a truth-based, a life-centered base in everything we do, it crashes. It doesn't crash because it doesn't crash because we have a problem. We don't have a problem right now, Pete. 
We have the results of problems. We have thinking that is not in alignment to the way this world is designed. And we're creating imaginary worlds in our head. And then, oh my God, these imaginary worlds crash and we think something's wrong. Well, nothing's wrong. We just created something that had no life value, was not in aligned to goodness or truth or unity, okay? Not in harmony with the principles of the country, and it fell. That's not a mistake. That's a result of s- stupid ways of thinking and spiritually unhealthy viewpoints that have no basis in truth. You know, and 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 we and if we keep doing it and doing it and doing it over and over and over again, the living reality, which is for me God, or the living reality, which is creation beyond creation, or their universe beyond universe. It's a living reality. We will get kicked and we will tumble and we will fall. This is a biblical model. Whether you want to use the word sin and God is punishment or not, or whether you want to use sowing and reaping, which Jesus was fond of, you can describe it in Hebrew, midah keneged midah. It doesn't make a difference. It's karma. It's actions that take place in lack of alignment to the way this world is properly designed fail. Actions that are in alignment to the way this world is designed that increase goodness, prosper, expand, and grow. It's the basic model of good and evil. It's not a debate. It's built into the design of the world. So there is a way. I mean, there is something beyond opinion. We start with reality and life first, not our opinions. Not our opinion. The nation pretty incredible. Again, immigrants can come here and build a life. And it doesn't mean that they have to become rich. They can have a life that's better than the life. <laughs> desperate to come. I have Iraqis talking to me all the time. Please get me to America. Please get me to America. Desperate, desperate to come here. And again, we fail to realize this internally. You know, one of the things I love to point out in terms of taking things for granted is we can poop into potable water, push up a lever, and it disappears. And someone else feels this, never give it a second thought. I mean, it is as decadent a thing as you can do throughout most of the world. It's like shocking. And yet we have this struggle where we just cannot get along. Have all this luxury, all this opulence, all this comfort. You know, like you can't withstand any level of discomfort. It's not freedom from religion, it's freedom of religion. If you don't want to practice, that is part of the of, from. So the day-to-day things that we have to try to get along with our neighbor. Okay, for those that don't want to do it, they've got to get there at their own pace. The person right now who's like, okay, Rabbi Mike, what do I do? How do I day-to-day work on my Wherever I'm at on the religious spectrum, what do I do every day? Well, it's, uh, I put it in the book. You know, and, and, uh, you know, if you can't afford it, let me know. I'll send you a copy. And I don't care if you buy it or not, really, honestly. It's important knowledge. Okay. I put it in the six fix. We build, you start your life on life centered priorities. For instance, you can be a good father and go to work, or a good mother and go to work and work 20 hours a day, seven days a week, and never see your own children. And never have something, never spend time with your own child and educate your own child. Is that a correct way to parent where you're putting money over your actual presence with the children? One of the good things about COVID is people were staying home a little bit with their kids. So our economic system and our way of living in our home have to put things that are valuable first, okay? Valuable first, meaning your time spent with your kids, the, the, the sanctity of your family. I mean, would encourage everyone to get a clear sense of the right value priorities and relationship priorities. Okay, I outlined them very simply in the book and apply them. For instance, Peter, have you ever had a cold and went to work? Well, how dare you go to 
work with a cold without asking the other people in the office whether they mind it. How what, You're mistreating your physical body. All right, you may have a good work ethic. I understand that I've gone to work many times with a cold, but I'm using that as an exaggerated example. Do we stop and say, my physical body and my health and well being is more important than a deal in the office? Do we put creation, our physical bodies, the, the, the very you know, bodies that God fabricated? Do we put that more important than earning money? Okay. Do we, for, uh, with a teenager, does a teenager put the, their freedom more importantly than respect for other people around them? And they do the kind of reckless, crazy intoxication and, and wantonness that teenagers do. Why? Because they're expressing freedom in a way that doesn't include other priorities too. They're entitled to their freedom. They're entitled to do it, but they have to do it in a way that includes other people. It's not that we're not doing anything wrong in the United States. What we're doing is exploring everything. And we're not balancing all the different factors that are involved in making a decision process. You know, and everyone has to do it. You know, husbands have to be aware of their wives' needs. Wives have to be aware of their husbands. You know, I've counseled couples where where the women were complaining that the husbands were not giving them adequate foreplay. Okay. And I had to explain to them male physiology that it's a, it's delicate, that we sometimes can't control ourselves. And I, the same way you would explain to a man some of the difficulties that take place each month where women feel because their physiology is different. You see what I mean? The problem in the marriage was that the woman had absolutely no idea what was going on inside a man that made him just so deliberately uh, sexual without enough uh, romance. But the minute she understood there was a physiological problem, and it's not easy. There was some understanding, and this is intimate stuff. We don't talk to each other. We don't learn from each other. Okay? Humility, open up and listen to the wisdom. Because I'm telling you, every moment of the day, God is bringing you wisdom from people. It's right there, all the answers to your questions. They come right to you. This is a spiritual world we live in. And turn on the wisdom receptacle. Some of that wisdom poured. I mean, how do you do that? Wisdom has requires care. If you don't care for other people, if you don't care about making life better, that's a missing piece of wisdom. Okay, a white supremacist who doesn't care about the soul of a person who is not white is not caring. Okay, care. You can have your opinion about superiority. I'm not going to get in the middle of that, but you still have to care. This is another soul, and it's another American citizen. So let's be let's care. We also have to have truth. Okay, science is one piece of truth. Spirituality is another piece of truth. No one knows truth completely, so we need to humbly look for truth. And then the most important thing is balance, is balance. It is critical to have reproducing heterosexual families in any functional society to form a lineage of continuity between men and women and propagating. This is the spiritual spine behind a people of God, which is the, what biblical thinking is like. But it's also important to have all of the variations and diversities that are part of nature in part in our societies. And a lot of the, 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 the homosexual and one of the intergender stuff, these are naturalist components that, that, that are seeking to unify with biblical knowledge. Whereas in the past 2000 years, they were at each other's throats. So, because, you know, that, 
So you, you have to bring all of these components in, not for our way of thinking, but for how this world is designed. You know, if you have a world where there are over 1,500 species that engage in homosexuality, you can't just say the creator made a mistake. Okay? It must have a purpose. Okay? You can't separate these intergender issues from, from the ecological devastations in nature and, and, the, and, and the, the, the upsetting of the natural balance of male and female in this world. They are interrelated issues. Okay, you got to, you know, you got to dig deeper. You got to break it down. It's much more subtle than this cartoon that we have. You know, these cowboys versus Native Americans. We're reducing everything to a cartoon. It's not a cartoon. Okay? So, you know, oh, you have to listen. You have to open up and you have to dare to think differently and seek prayerfully. Seek a unified understanding that is greater than anything that you think you could ever imagine. You know, pray and seek, because I think you were right, Pete. You know, you never know every twist and turn along the journey, but if we seek together in unity with respect for diversity and always seek goodness with wisdom, we'll get there. We'll get there. And we'll get there fast. He's one of the people that said seek one of the things I tried to bring, not so much in general, as I'm working in zones where I'm trying to get these realities locally. You can't assume to improve the condition of something else that you refuse to understand the condition of. You have to get out amongst it. And there's a lot of wisdom in, in cultural acuity because you have to be able to sit in something that is, I say, it's miscomfortable. It's not a comfort you can't attain, it's miscomfort. And then once you learn how the Afghans made decisions, you build down a better idea of when they made a decision. And then they don't do it. You know, the passive aggressive is a is a cultural asymmetry, right? So when you have yes. greed, corruption, incompetence, these perceptions, you've got cultural incongruence. And that requires you as a person engaging in change to go in, spend time in the culture, build trust. Listen, shut up, you know, and, and ask questions to understand more so that you can begin to understand if you're going to get this change, how you can go through, pri primarily, if you can go through their path, it'll be a lot better. So what is their cultural path? But you can't get that without wisdom, tolerance, and the ability to withstand some discomfort. That, that's exactly it. You know, I, 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 I was initially extremely uncomfortable with Christianity. My first experience with this, it actually made me sick. I would go into a church and the sight of a cross because of the history would make me actually physically nauseous. And my solution to that was not to run away, but was to go more often, study more and figure out what my relationship is with them. I do the same thing with the many diversities of Islam right now. You know, it's very easy to be afraid, okay? And very easy to run away and judge. But the correct path, which is loving thy neighbor, is to sit and stretch a little bit, get past your discomfort levels, and find the common humanity, okay? Find the common truth. And also, let's face it, you know, we live in a reality. Everyone has to breathe and eat. We have commonalities that are given to us. We don't have to search to find it. We're, it's right here. It's right here. You know, the job is easier if we stay reality-based and not opinionocracy-based. You know, that's spiritual health. You know, and that's what's going to make America stronger is, is, is returning to true sense of spiritual health. And it's doable. Easily. Easily. It's doable. Spend time with someone else is something. 
develop that comfort. You can also begin to realize that by again turn. I like to move the camera, flip the camera around, and have them look. You should play chess. You always considering your opponent's level. Where do they right. find the aggressive, defensive? Are they going to make a mistake? Have I let them a pro? You know, and when you consider what they might do, it opens up possibilities. Exactly. Right. And the, the Talmud says, yeah. the Talmud says, don't judge anyone until you've walked in their shoes. And by judge, they don't mean this is right or this is wrong. They mean don't condemn someone until you've walked in their shoes. Well, and that's right. you know, book of the why. I remind yeah. myself of that all the time. My Western mind wanted to go the mind to the objective. But the objective moved so much, there was never a direction. Always yeah. had to be prepared to adjust. And a lot of times, just stop and sit and wait because everything else had to catch up. I had, I had to catch up to where they went because I was headed off like a bullet going towards the sure. But the, the work wasn't anywhere between A and B. It was off over here in this farm somewhere. And I was the right person. So I could be introduced to the other person to talk about the actual thing. It turned out that A and B, I should talk about like the military is like, a cloud that's the culture and then the military is just shooting arrows through a cloud trying to solve a problem well that's right also, yeah there is also a fundamental mental problem our computer our little personal computers here they're programmed in a way that's very primitive we're very we're programmed for either versus or i mean this is this that is that, and there's nothing in between. It's called the law of excluded middles. And either and or is very rare. You know, look, if I'm going to be monogamous, I cannot cheat on my wife. That's an either or. Done. Very rare. Most everything is a little bit neither one or the other but it's a both and it's not our creativity and our judgment. It's God's creativity. It's both. And there's justice and there's mercy. Okay. Every male has a female aspect. Every female has a male aspect. Even if they're binary, every single male has female aspects, which they would benefit from. And they'd have better marriages, in fact, if they contacted them. And every woman would be much more secure if she developed her male aspect. You can't just go binary versus transgender as if this is a cartoon. It doesn't make any sense. Let's discuss gender, gender polarities. Let's discuss militarism, which relied on cults of men. Okay. Let's discuss the destruction of family because of war that kept women more imprisoned in their house, terrified of what would happen with their children. There are many things that are involved on this in this transgender dis discussion than just, oh, they do things differently. Okay, but you have to begin with some humility and say, so look, I'm a simple guy. Peter, I believe this truth is right here. And God gives us every single piece of the puzzle. And we have to say, okay, how did God design this? Not how I think it should be. How is it designed? And therefore, how can I help? And align my actions, alignment to the way this world was created, a true natural law. That's what we have to do. It's not just your opinion versus mine. You know? And I, I, I don't want to go too much longer. I've got you for an hour and I don't I'm honored. I really am. Oh, and I've enjoyed it. I mean, this goes back to the Greeks. The Greeks have been trying to solve it longer than we've been a nation. And I, I forget. I think it was. I think it was Plato. It, you know, there's a lot of things that have been said for a long time. A lot of problems that, have been, whether they're Sumerian problems or Persian problems, going way back, trying to solve the same thing. Balance. Uh, looking at problems like they're binary, but they're never binary. They're, they're binary. not. Yeah. You know. Everything. Right. I'm I, I'm a right. I'm a bottom line Jew. Uh -huh. There is God, there is truth, and everything else is an opinion. And when I believe any one opinion is the totality of truth, 
I've made a God in my image that's idolatry, bad stuff. No idolatry. Well, man, you are good stuff, and I love it. The six Thank you. Spiritual health care for a stronger America. And Please, the six fix is the most important thing I have ever written in terms of helping people. It's really helped people. Please. Let me, let me be the benefit of saying this too. When someone says this to you, someone has written, I mean, many, many books, and they said this is the best thing they've ever written. And you get to hear all this wisdom coming in. If you don't get the book, you're bananas. And this is, we've got to look at authors as messengers, putting their absolute best work in. This is someone that's multiple books saying this is the best book they've ever written. So if this at all resonates with you, spend the 15 bucks, get the book, let it start to evolve how you live your life. Because ultimately, and this goes back to the Greek again, if you live your life, I think it's Plato again, if you live your life according to the truth that you're trying to do to feed from a person, nothing else matters. Nothing else can harm you. They can kill you. It doesn't matter because you live the life that you were supposed to live, the best life. It's just not you're living your best life. You're better than that. So anyhow, get Michael's book, The Six Fix, Spiritual Healthcare for a Stronger Bear. Link is there. If you listen to the podcast side, that'll be in the show notes. Anything in closing at all, Michael? No, I just want to encourage everyone. We can do this. We can do this. You know, just I want to just remember, God did a very curious thing. The word COVID comes from the Latin. Can be inter- I interpret it as coming from the Latin. Covide or covite, which means we live together. Covite. Let's live together. And we will get through this mess. It's that simple.